is Reason Revolution. I'm your host, Justin Clark. Thank you for joining us this week. I have another interview for you, and I'm really excited to share it. Joseph Becker is an attorney, author, and activist based out of New Jersey. A graduate of Emory University, Joseph practices entertainment law and, in his spare time, loves to play the drums and research philosophy, history, and science. His lifelong love of learning inspired him to write Annabelle and Aiden, a children's book series devoted to encouraging quote-unquote curiosity and scientific awareness in the next generation. The newest book, Annabelle and Aiden, Worlds Within Us, focuses on the Big Bang, cosmology, and the interconnectedness of nature. He has a Kickstarter campaign to help finance its production. We had a wonderful conversation about his path out of Orthodox Judaism, why science and critical thinking are so important, and the upcoming book in his Annabelle and Aiden series. I had a lot of fun talking to Joseph, and I hope you enjoy our conversation. So without any further ado, here's Joseph Becker. Joseph Becker, how's it going, sir? It's going well. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you for so much for joining me this week on Reason Revolution. I'm really looking forward to talking to you. Um, I know you have a very unique perspective. So let's start there. So what what was your deconversion process? How did you leave religion and kind of where are you now? Okay, so let's see if I could do this in a, in a few minutes. Um, <clears throat> I haven't told the story for a long, long time, and sometimes I have even trouble remembering the details. Basically, I grew up in a modern Orthodox home. My parents grew up traditional Jewish, but very much not so religious and very much exposed to the secular world. And, you know, it's just very moderate religious. Um, and then before I was born, they got very, very into it. Um, they befriended uh, a few r rabbis, and they got very, very interested in it. And my dad was always a lot more interested in it than my mother. And in a lot of Jewish families, the I guess kind of in a... I guess, yeah, I mean, I'll call it out. It's pretty misogynistic. I mean, the men, a lot more is... Everyone has their role to play, and the men have, you know, are... are, are held to a higher standard, and especially the firstborn sons. And I was a firstborn son. And my dad is kind of a, he's kind of, I mean, I guess all people are contradictions, but my dad is simultaneously the sweetest, most loving man that I know and my best friend. And at the same time, um, through through religion, he's expressed himself as he raised me in, 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 in very harsh, uh, his expectations of me were very high. Um, and he was always extremely loving, and I, I love both my parents, and I had great, um, I still have a great relationship with them. I did have a great childhood, but he was, he, he had a lot of expectations, and he was very strict with me for a lot of things. Um, but I always had doubts, and I figured everyone had doubts. And I remember being a little kid and going to synagogue and seeing people, you know, shuckling their, swaying their bodies back and forth and closing their eyes and, like, talking to God. And I remember looking at them when I was five or seven or 10. I don't know how old I was, or maybe it was through all those years. And I actually do remember thinking, really? Like, do they really think they're talking to some, like someone is someone or something is like hearing them? And like, like, I thought it was crazy. And I kept telling myself, you know, when I grow up, I'll understand. There must be something I don't understand. And that never came. I just never understood it better maybe a little bit when I was 18 19 and I started asking questions I lived in Israel for a year to study everything and I did meet some rabbis who gave at least tried to attempt to answer my questions in some reasonable way anyway cut to the chase I was pretty apathetic about it I never liked religion at all really hardly any of it a lot of people do I, I didn't um, and then when I was in I went through college I was, I figured can we, everyone Can was, we back up just a second? Because that's interesting. That's an interesting point. So you never really liked it. Could you no. elaborate on why you didn't really like it? Yes. I mean, I think I, you might know this better than I do. I think I've heard, I, I really don't know what it's like to grow up in a Christian home, but people have said something about like Judaism is about the rules and Christianity is about belief or there, there's some kind of saying about that, but it, it's true. I mean, you know, 
you can't have ice cream because you just you ate chicken an hour and a half ago. We have to wait three hours because you're not allowed to have meat and milk together. Uh, it's 8.32. You can't turn on your phone because it's the Sabbath. Sabbath isn't over yet. You have to wait 20 more minutes. You can't go out. You can't eat at any restaurants. You can't do anything ever. <laughs> I said, <laughs> all my. you're a good uh, interviewer because all my, my uh, bitterness is coming out. No, I mean, it's extremely... I mean, and also in ways that didn't make sense. Like I went to schools where you're sent home because there's the color white in your shoe. You know, like you'll wear a piece of clothing the wrong color. And then you'll say like, but where in the Bible, even according to Judaism, does it say anything about that? And the answer is n nowhere. It's just like 80% of what, what so many Orthodox Jews do is all cultural. It's all like man-made it's nothing it's like nothingness it doesn't mean anything and then i kept saying like well what does god want of me like where does it say this and where does it say that and it's so much of it is just cultural you know superstitious circle the wagons based on absolutely nothing and that that's one thing that bothered me so you, um, so you were bothered with the idea that these traditions um were not tied to to some sort of like <clears throat> Um, scripture or any kind of sort of um, religious tradition that's 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 codified in some respects. Right. So to summarize in, in like two to three sentences, I would say whether or not Judaism or at least the Judaism I was taught made sense to me or not. I hated doing it. I hated the restrictions. And then on top of that, I'm like, OK, I hate it. But a lot of people don't like it. But at least doesn't make sense. Like because I hated it. I wanted to maybe I, I had even more of a drive to understand the reasons behind it. And, and, those, and those reasons weren't there. So that made it even worse. No, that makes total sense. Um, th that makes total sense to me. Um, so I'll give you a, just a quick little bit about my background. So um, I grew up in, in basically a secular home. Um, I didn't grow up with religion at all. Um, I, I guess you could say I was culturally Christian, but even that stretching it because my parents didn't really give a shit. And um, I grew up with a dad who was pretty non-religious. Um, and I grew up with a mom who was pretty non-religious and, and did some religious things with my sister for like social reasons. Um, but, you know, I, I don't think I ever heard my folks refer to us as being Christians. I don't think I ever, I, I can count on one hand the amount of times I've been to church for a religious reason, which doesn't include funerals or weddings or concerts. Um, and so much like you, I guess, in some respects with, with maybe Christianity, I sort of view all of religion as an outsider. I don't, you know, to me, it's always been sort of an intellectual thing. And what I'm gathering from our conversation is for you, you were sort of looking at it and trying to make it make sense. Yeah. You're trying to figure out the order of it. And so yeah. was I. And all of the years of me studying it, then that was why I got interested in studying religion was because I wanted to understand how it worked. And then once I finally understood how it kind of worked, I realized it was nonsense. So Could you explain to me how it works? Because I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I don't either. Um, I think I know what you mean, though. Right. That basically we understand how it works in that it doesn't work. It doesn't make any sense. And, you know, I a lot of people love it. I mean, I'll continue telling my story. But to cut to the chase that you might think is interesting, I'm actually married to someone. I grew up Orthodox, Jude, Jewish. And right now I'm in a marriage where my wife is an Orthodox Jew and she loves religion. She loves, she has, feels like she has a relationship with God. He's looking out for her, you know, you know, every day he kills 10,000 children from malaria, but he really, you know, wants her to do well on her job interview, whatever, you know, but she believes this and, you know, but, but, but. You know, she says it probably doesn't make when I really talk to her, she says it probably doesn't make sense. It doesn't. But she really enjoys it. She doesn't feel like she needs to question it, um, you know. But anyway, no, I, that's very interesting because I've, you know, it, it reminds me of kind of talking to um, or not talking to, but reading about Dave Silverman, who's the president yes. of American Atheist, who's yes. in sort of a similar situation that you are. 
Um, and then uh, my friend that, you know, our mutual friend, Steve Miller, who we yeah. talked about before we started recording, um, is sort of in that same boat or whatever. And yeah. So let me ask you another quick question. I hate because I love kind of peeling the layers totally. back if you don't mind. Um, sure. So when you were talking about your wife sort of feeling God, was there ever a moment in your life where you felt God or was it always sort of a, a intellectual thing for you? I mean, so we could debate all day what the word spiritual means, you know, and, you know, but according to some definitions of the word spiritual, if you want to call it you know, I mean, like, I'm an artist. I'm, I'm, I, 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 as I get older, unfortunately, I do feel it going away a little bit, which is a terrible thing. But I do, and especially when I was younger, at certain music, I will, I will bring myself to tears. I, I love, I'm a very, you know, if you want to call it romantic or spiritual or, you know, I, I, I do feel, so is that feeling God? Um, you know, that depends on how you define the word God. I mean, you, you and I think it's where I'm feeling feelings, you know, whatever, you know, chemicals are happening in my brain in a certain way that's making me feel certain things. Um, but to answer your question, so, so maybe what you're asking is, did I ever really, really believe in God or really, really feel God? I've tried and a little bit, maybe sometimes when I was 18 or 16 or 15, a little bit, I never, I never had a unbreakable faith never but um but i i think i did have times where i i i managed to convince myself enough that i did kind of feel like someone was listening to me sure the, i mean i lived i lived 200 feet away from the western wall for in israel in, in the old city of jerusalem for a year and a half you know and i felt it there for sure it's hard not to you know <laughs> Interesting. So my my previous episode of my podcast, I had a long form conversation with my friend Tyler Lovins, who is I don't even know how you would describe him because he's not really a Christian and he's not really an atheist. He's not he's I don't even know how you describe him. his 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 ideas are very, very interesting. Um, but I guess what you would say is that he's on the this sort of extreme liberal end of theology is kind of where he's at. Okay. And what do you mean by that? So the thing about, like the, yeah, go ahead. Like Deepak Chopra ism. <laughs> not that woo woo, not that, okay. not that, not that wild, but mm. what my buddies, I would say he's closer to, um, there was a 19th century philosopher named Soren Kierkegaard mm -hmm. and, and, and Kierkegaard in one of his books, and I can't remember what it's called at the moment, but he talks about the idea of, of love and, and love of God is sort of being this like pure thing. So my buddy's really interested in religious language and how it conveys human concepts. So okay. when he talks about the idea of God, he talks about the idea of God is what he calls the quote unquote ground of being. So it's not like a man with a beard who lives in the sky who does things. It's more of a, it's just more of like sort of this broad metaphor. So my buddy's very interested in God as metaphor. And sure. while I appreciate to a, to an extent that position, my whole thinking on the subject is why deal with the metaphor? Why don't we just get to the heart of it, which is that that life and existence are complicated, and why do we use these shorthands? for concepts that are very complex, but then when you say them to other people, mean something completely different. Right. So, you know, like for most people, when you say God, they don't think of it as a God as a metaphor. They think of God as a big dude with a beard who lives in the right. sky who does things. Like that's, right. I mean, that's most people. And right. so I've always been interested in this idea of the disconnect between really, really intelligent people who sort of make rationalizations for religion mm -hmm. and everybody else who just sort of accepts it. And that these two people don't hold the same position that, and, and they're, they're really at odds with one another, but, but because I'm kind of with Sam Harris in that if you're going to be a moderate or liberal in a religious tradition, then you have to accept the fact that you are in the same camp as the fundamentalists, regardless. Like if you identify as a liberal Christian, you have to live with the fact that you're a part of a faith tradition. That's just as much Westboro Baptist church as it is you. And like, right. that's, you have to live with that. Right. And, and, and so I've always felt like 
with some of the more liberal traditions, just why why do it? Just let right. it go and and it just to kind of embrace life, I guess. Right. Right. So, you know, to me, I, I, I don't like the idea of God as a metaphor. I just think that we can do away with that and just right. accept, I, right, yeah. Right. I agree. I think it's dangerous. I think people are playing with fire because, uh, for example, there's someone I know who is, is, is a good friend of me and my wife and, and they're great. And, but she has, I think she has that position and she, you know, I, I'm, I'm, we could t my children's educa education is a whole different complicated conversation, but I'm s so scared to teach them about God. And I think it'll cripple them intellectually for, for reasons that you and I would probably agree on if we talked about it. But she says, you know, she's an atheist, but she's like, I don't mind teaching my kids about God because it's a metaphor. And I'm like, to you, it's a metaphor, but to them, how do you know what it'll be? And once you anthropomorphize nature, you're basically, they're going to become so much less interested and less curious about how things actually work if you anthropomorphize nature in their brain to the, to the point where, like, there's kind of some kind of sentient creature or being controlling things. But that's a whole different conversation. But that's why I agree with you, and that's why I think it's dangerous. Um, I also think pantheists, I don't know if you're kind of referring to pantheism or more of a Pope Francis, Bernie Sanders kind of moderate religion. But for pantheism, I think if you're a pantheist, you're an atheist. And the only difference is semantics. I agree. One of my favorite quotes, and, and I'm going to be paraphrasing it, but that um, the all encompassing and the non-existent often look very much alike. And, and so I... Say that one more time. Uh, the all-encompassing and the non-existent often look very much alike. Interesting. And so, to me, I, I you know, that was always the problem I had with, like, sort of the idea of, like, the Spinoza-like God, where God yeah. is nature. And it's like, why don't you just say that nature is nature? Like, why right. why create this metaphor? And and, right. and, and, cause, and maybe part of it is the fact that, like, I'm, you know, somebody who's in the humanities, I'm an historian, but I... I you know, and I do enjoy literature from time to time, but I'm more of a practical person and right. I find metaphors and symbolism in the defense of, of bullshit to be a real right. problem. And that's right. because to mint, like I said earlier, the difference between the metaphor and the bullshit is melts away because of the language. Right. Uh, but that's really my huge problem with it, it, you know, in general. The other thing I was just going to mention briefly about, like, talking to kids about God. Now, I don't have any children. Yeah. I'm going to say I don't, I know jack shit. But one thing I can tell you is this. One thing I do know about kids pretty much under the age of 10 is that the line between what is real and what is fantasy is very blurry. Yeah. And so when you introduce concepts and use terminology and language in a very blurry way to describe reality... You are then sort of you, you. I'll agree with you in how you quoted it. How you said it. You're playing with fire, you know. Yeah. I, yeah. I always have made the point that, like, you know, imagine if we didn't introduce religion to kids until they were at least ten, and imagine right. what the world would be like. Right. 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 I used to say, "Where is God?" And you know, people, he's hiding. He's hiding, and I'm like. He's really, really good at hiding. Like he's really, really good at hiding. He may he makes the whole world act exactly as one would suppose it would if there was no God. You know, like he's amazing at this. I guess only God. You know, but um, Matt, I feel like you and I could talk for a long time. Of course. Um, but you know, Matt, you know, if if you talk about God to a lot of these people, oh, he's not the man in the sky. He's not here. He's not there. He's everything. He's nothing all at the same time. And then, and then it's just like, I always come to Matt Dillahunty's quote, a God that does not manifest, a God that does not manifest itself in reality is indistinguishable from a God that does not exist. I agree. And that, and that's, and that's a, and that's a, a solid point. The, the other thing is that I guess the pragmatist of me can't handle the poetic nonsense. Like, right. like, you know. I can understand it to a point. Like I'm a huge fan of Carl Sagan. I love Carl Sagan. Right. And and and, and in Cosmos, when he talks about you know, um, the surface of the Earth is a shore of the cosmic ocean. We've recently waded a little way out, and the water seems inviting. Like I understand what he means by that. 
Right. That we're at the, we're at the we're at the very beginning of our understanding of the world, and that we're 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 now just beginning to do it. And as time goes on, we'll learn more and more about nature. Like his metaphor is a clear metaphor, and it makes right. sense. Or when he says things like "we're made of star stuff," like that's a clear metaphor. Right. Or um, the we are the way for the universe to know itself. It, these are all very poetic phrases, but. Right. They're rooted in reality. They're rooted in things I can see and understand. Right. And they actually are technically true. We are technically made of stardust. I mean, after it was transformed into a million different things and, you know, and, and we are we are technically part of the universe because we're made of the same matter of the universe and we are, you know, but, but right, you, you're making the point that um, we kind of also get poetic. And to answer your question, why do pantheists and... Also, you know, the, the the kind of mindset we're talking about, you ask why have the metaphor? The answer is it's fun, you know, that they, you know, they they believe that. And I kind of see, you know, real, you know, I mean, they're wrong, but they see reality as too boring. I mean, Tim mentioned really made me appreciate, like, isn't reality enough? Like, isn't this enough? Why? He, he quotes someone in his, um, he has that, did you see, do you know Tim mentioned? Yeah. I'm he has that like four mentioned. minute animated um, cartoon thing on you. It's great. And he, he said he quotes someone. I don't know if it was Shakespeare. You know, why paint? Why throw paint on the flowers, on the roses? Like the flowers are beautiful. It's reality, you know, and why are you throwing paint on them with all this mysticism and, and stuff? There was just the solar eclipse and people were passing around these articles. Judaism says the solar eclipse is God, pray God. I'm like, stop, just enjoy it for what it is. There's a rock flying in front of another rock. Okay, the sun isn't a rock. There's a rock flying in front of the sun. Just, it's beautiful, it's amazing. It reminds us of our of our time here and how quick we, you know, how fragile, the fragility of the universe. But don't, you know, don't, you know, it, it just kind of ruins it. I agree. I think part of it is the fact that, 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 in many respects, I think we as humans have a built-in solipsism about it. We are obsessed with ourselves. Yeah. And and we are obsessed yeah. with feeling like we're special. And, yes. And we're special in as much as we're special to each other. But yeah. we're not special in sort of the cosmic sense. Right. You know? Um, and, and, and I think for some people, it's that sort of cosmic loneliness. The idea that the universe doesn't give a shit about you. Right. And and I don't know, I've always felt the opposite approach where it's like, you know, the universe doesn't care about me. The universe can't care. It just is. Right. You right. Know? And, right. And, and so that that sort of, I think, precludes me to actually like care about my life and how right. I treat other people and how I interact with the world and how we how, how we interact as a species and how we flourish because this is it. And and I, I think for you know, I'm with you where it's like, why isn't this enough? Because this is right. amazing. Right. Um, there's that great quote, I think, from Douglas Adams, who says something along the lines of like, aren't the daisies pretty enough? Why do we have to think the fairies brought them to us or or, invent, or, or made exactly. them for us? You know, exactly. and it's like, yeah, like they're good enough. And, right. and, and Sagan makes this other point in Cosmos where, where he says... Something along the lines of like, yes, this is beautiful. It's amazing. It's wonderful. It also has the added benefit of being true. Yes. And and yes. and and minorly and, important, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, and 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 so to me, it, that was what I was always really interested in. And when I became an atheist when I was nineteen, you know, and I was always pretty non-religious, and I had sort of flirted with different religions and things like that. But once I just once I sort of discovered what I was, it was kind of like. It was this sort of beautiful freeing moment where you sort of get to you get to kind of experience the world as it is. Yes. And instead of like as you sort of projected onto it, you sort of get to kind of it's like an unfiltered live feed and you just sort of yes. get it. Yeah. Um, and, and I've always appreciated that. I And I enjoy that as a human being. But mm -hmm. some people don't, I guess. Yeah. For me, when I when I when I realized I didn't believe in God's existence, which, and then along with that, pretty much anything I was taught, for me, it wasn't enjoying the world as it was. It was an incredible emptiness because all my beliefs just vanished. And then I'm like, so how the hell does everything work? And then I was like a kid in a candy store and I read everything and it was amazing. And I'm still really excited about it. 
um, and I want to tell the world about it. And that's, and we could talk about my children's books later, but I just, I mean, that is why I started that. I, I, you know, my wife was sick of hearing about it. The people in my life were sick of hearing about it. I was so excited by learning all these new things. And then I realized, you know, the lay person on the street doesn't know half of them. I mean, especially in America. Um, I think if you went up to 10 people on the street between the ages of 20 and 30 uh, in any, in any, you know, pretty much anywhere in the country, you know, um, two of them will understand what evolution is. Yeah. Uh, eight of them will think that evolution is a one time event that happened over a bunch of years a long time ago where like 10 monkeys turned into people. I think that's <laughs> what most people think evolution is. And it's so beautiful and it's amazing and it's so important and it helps us grow our food and make medicine and pretty much everything we do. And uh, it's it's crazy to me that people don't know it. And also what we were talking about before about reality versus kind of ruining reality by adding this stuff you know, mysticism to it and stuff that we have no idea whether it's true or not is uh, my children's books, my, my book series, Annabelle and Eden, they're, the entire point of that is to tell people that reality is just as exciting as fiction. So that's that's one thing that I wanted to say before. But, um, that's but anyway, yeah. But so, yeah, so let's transition into talking about that. So you had this this love of learning and you were reading you know, voraciously and you were gaining this knowledge and it inspired you to write a series of both beautiful and, and, and exceptionally accessible um, children's works. So tell us about sort of the origin of Annabelle and Aiden and kind of where, how it developed and what you're working on now. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, if it's cool with you, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of build up to that. So I'll just finish my story of, about deconversion, because that's kind of how it started anyway. Please, but, please um, continue. Yeah, back to our, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, you're having a good conversation when you're totally trailed off. But um, so yeah, I mean, it all leads up to the book series. So okay. It, it was really after I got married, and, and I was living in, in Manhattan. And I went to a speed, you know, I was kind of an apathetic Jew. I went through the motions. I kind of enjoyed some of it. Um, but I heard one rabbi speak and he gave rational proofs or rational arguments for the existence of God. And I was blown away and I was so happy to hear him because I didn't know that that conversation really exists. And he got me thinking and thinking and thinking and I'll, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll make it short. Basically, he, I spoke to him afterwards, and he said he debates atheists on on YouTube. You know, he he had, he's done a few debates, so I didn't really, I didn't even really know exactly what an atheist was, but I I looked it up, and for the next five years, I've I just I watched hundreds and hundreds of hours of debates, and I Christopher Hitchens was the first one that I was like, wow. <laughs> He was amazing to me. And, you know, Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, I saw them debate the rabbis, the priests, the pastors, the the imams, everyone. And I, I just, everything they were saying, I'm like, this is how I felt all my life. Everything they're saying is exactly how I felt my whole life. They're, they're saying it way better than I could. I didn't know there was someone else that thought this way. It was just really exciting for me. I read all their books. I listened to all their podcasts. Anyway. Fast forward a few years, um, I'm just really passionate about everything I learned. I, I'm, you know, I feel like, uh, you know, I, I, I feel like I just want to share it with the world. As Bill Nye says, when you're in love with something, you want to share it with the world. So, um, you know, the life that I live, even now, it's pretty lonely. I don't, I mean, my, you know, my, now, I told my parents, you know, and my, my wife knows everything and my close friends know everything, but I'm not really friends with many atheists. I don't, it, it's lonely. Um, and writing these children's books is kind of how I could like get my passion for science and curiosity out. So I started doing it and I wanted to name the book series Sophie and McDonald just because I thought that sounded goofy and funny and people were like, nah, I don't like the way that sounds. And then someone's like, why don't you name them after your kids? 
And my wife, who's totally supportive of me in, in, in this endeavor, was like, yeah, that's cool. And I'm like, Annabelle and Aiden, it sounds great. Those are my two children. So right now we are writing our third book. Um, our first book was on Darwinian evolution. I had to get that out because I was, I was really excited about it. And I feel like no one ever told Darwinian evolution like a story. And I've even read articles like, it's not a story. That's why, you know, what was this book? I don't think it was Sapiens. No, I read another book. I'm trying to remember what it was. But it talks about how, you know, we evolved to, to be inclined to believe stories and tell stories. And the reason why we don't understand science well is because it's not a story. And he's like, evolution is not a story. And I'm like, of course it's a story. Once upon a time, there was the first living thing. And from that, it made copies of itself. And then they, some of them weren't perfect copies. And they went off to different environmental uh ecosystems it's a whole story it's it's a beautiful story so i told it in the children's book and i you know i i'm like am i even going to raise like 500 dollars on kickstarter i was i was terrified and i raised 4400 dollars and then i made a second book on skepticism and critical thinking and that raised eleven thousand dollars and as i speak i'm in my third kickstarter for a book about the big bang and right now it's about it's at about Thirteen and a half thousand dollars with with about ten days, eleven days to go. So I'm really excited about it, and uh, I made the website at AnnabelleAndAiden.com, and it's just really exciting for me. And um, and we're growing. You know, we're still small. It's still the beginning, but we're growing, and people are enjoying the books, and I'm enjoying working on them. Well, that's that's fantastic. It, I um, I gave a talk uh, a few months ago at a Unitarian Universalist church. Um, mm -hmm. And the way UU churches tend to work is instead of doing a sermon, they'll do a lecture. And they asked me to come and talk. Um, I, I, um, I wrote my master's thesis on a free thought order by the name of Robert Ingersoll. And, and as somebody who appreciates alliterative titles, Annabelle and Aiden is spot on because my, my thesis title is Ingersoll Infidels in Indianapolis. <laughs> so, so I like, I like alliterative titles. They work. There's a, nice. they, they, they have a nice kick to them. Nice. So I Thank go, you. so I go to this Unitarian Universalist service and they asked me, they said, we have a children's section for the service. Do you have a book recommendation? And I was like, I don't have a fucking clue. I mean, there's so many like children's books about God, but there yeah. aren't that very many about like skepticism and critical thinking and science. And the only one I could think of was a one called I Wonder by Annika Harris, who's Sam yeah. Harris's wife. Yeah. Which is a cute little book. And, uh, and that was great. Um, but besides like that book, and then I know there's another series of children's books that David Smalley's involved in. Yes. Where, One's called like Charlie and the Tortoise. Another one's called like, like, uh, 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 like Richie Doodles, which is about Richard Feynman. Okay. And, and, and so like there's that and then there's your stuff. And, and, and I think it's really great because you are tapping into an un, to truly an untapped market, um, where as more and more Americans and, and more and more people in sort of the English speaking world, um, embrace reason and critical thinking and skepticism and free thought that um, th there will be a market for how do we talk to kids and right. and and I think sometimes we often we often the, the atheist movement often gets a reputation for being sort of old gray haired white dudes and and I think it's really good to have a diversity of viewpoints especially ways to be able to reach out to children that are sort of fun and informative. So I certainly applaud your efforts on that because I, I think that that's a, that's a, a niche that sort of needs filling in a lot of ways. Thanks, Justin. I agree. Um, there's, there's a few things, there's a few books coming out. I did hear of, I wonder, um, there's a book on evolution called small change, tiny changes, I think. Okay. But very, very few. I mean, there's like, you know, on evolution right now, there might be four children's books in the world. On God, there might be, uh, you know, 400. I mean, there, it's very little. And on skepticism, I think my second book might be the only children's book on just on nothing but skepticism and critical thinking. I think. I'm not sure. 
But if there are others out there, I don't think it would be more than one or two others. So it is sorely needed. I, I, I totally agree. I mean, I, I've always said for years that um, and somebody it was funny. I was at I was at a talk or something. And I remember saying something along the lines of like sort of my typical boilerplate answer was like, you know, they need to teach a freshman semester class, freshman high school semester class in critical thinking. Yeah. And, and some woman who was incredibly insightful caught me right in my tracks and she went like, why start that late? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, and, and that showed my own ignorance because my thought was like, kids aren't going to get it. And that was dumb on my part. And part of that just shows me how much shows you how much I don't know my kids. But <laughs> but it's but it's also like she said, like, no, they need to start that in like kindergarten or first right. grade. And and, and, right. and I think that's right. Because one of the challenges that we face, I think, as a as a as a people, is the fact that, you know, and, and I hate to go back to singing, but it's true, is that we're a society that is becoming increasingly dependent upon science, but they have a very, very facile understanding of it. Right. And, and because of that, we live in a culture where people are uh, people. And that's always sort of been America in some weird way. Americans, right. I think, just have a a palate for bullshit. In, in a yes. way that like people in other Western countries don't have. There's a new book coming out from a, an author from, from Newsweek or the, the Atlantic called fantasy land where he kind of, he, he traces like, you know, to a 200 year, sort of a 500 year history of America and its relationship to bullshit and like how much it loves, wow. how much it loves nonsense. And so he sort of starts with the Puritans and instead of writing the traditional narrative of saying that, you know, they're, that these people were fighting for religious freedom and this and that and the other, and they come to a new land seeking freedom. He actually writes about them as what they are, which was they were religious nutwads and that so much so that the Anglican Church couldn't even handle them, and that's why they had to come over to America. Right. And and so he sort of traces this history, and and you know uh, that's uh, that's tough. I, and and I think in America, especially where you have a population that believes more in the existence of angels than believes in in the theory of evolution. Yeah. And and maybe it's the way we're framing the discussion. You know, like we always say things like, do you do believe in evolution? Do you believe right. in climate change? We shouldn't really ask it that way. We should right. say, do Except. you accept the science of evolution? Do you accept the science of climate change? Because right. you can believe whatever the hell you want. Beliefs right. have no bearing on whether or not something's actually true. Right. And, and so, you know, that's another way of framing it as well. And so I think it's great that there, because of you and others, that there's becoming these increasing you know increasingly more accessible materials for children because yeah. i remember as a kid i didn't get any of that you know yeah. growing up in the you know growing up in the public schools in southern in, you know in sort of south S central indiana uh, south central indiana you know uh -huh. and in the midwest you know you just don't really hear any of thing about that right. um so i think it's i think it's good right right yeah the the rabbis we, I actually went to a high school where they did hire a science teacher to teach us science. I do remember learning about evolution. Um, and then, the you know, if we went to the rabbis about it, they had some sort of apologist answer. You know, you know, I, some of them would say it's not true. Some of them would say it is true because, you know, but God was behind it, you know, which is which is crazy because that would mean that about 90 I think 99.9% .9 of God's creations would would have been failures because they've all died out. <laughs> and and this is the most long, roundabout, awkward, painfully wasteful way that, that a God could ever create humans. True. But cool, you know. I, I always uh -huh. loved uh, I always loved Jerry Coyne's example in his book, Why Evolution is True, that one of the strongest arguments against God is the um, laryngeal nerve. Which is, which is the nerve that comes down your neck, comes up and like through and around your heart and comes back up. And, yeah. it's, and it's a holdout from when we were used to be fish and when it used to be up on the, the back end of the fish body. And as we okay. went from being fish to mammals to upright primates, that the laryngeal nerve, instead of becoming a straight shot, it comes down, comes back around. And like, right. that's 
bullshit design like that's crappy design that's right. like that's like having a television where you put the hdmi cord like in front of the fucking screen it's yeah. just stupid yeah. um and, and i it, think richard dawkins has a thing on that with drafts drafts have the long neck and it's even worse with them i mean it's like the worst thing for them you know it, yeah. And I always think of the um what the joke by Neil deGrasse Tyson like, you know, how convenient the design where they put the, you know, the sewage the sewage plant next to the entertainment complex or something like that or or the sewage right. plant next to the next to the amusement park. And right. it's and, and it's that's really where I mean, we're very poorly designed. I mean, if 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 God, yeah. you know, if God did it, then he sucks at it. Yeah. Um, yeah. you know. Or he's really 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 good at hiding and in the words of, I forgot which philosopher, but you might know, um, you know, we, we, you know, people would have us believe in a God that gave us reason and, 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 and a brain and have us only to forego their use. Yeah, no, that's true. And, 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 and it's, it, 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 that's part of the, the problem. And it's, and it's very hard to, to try to communicate that to people. Because it's kind of like, I know Bill Maher said something like this once where he says like, because you're selling an invisible product. Yeah. It, it's so fucking easy because you can sort of warp it to however you want. Right. Unfalsifiable. Unfalsifiable. You know, um, you know, pray. Did God heal the sick? He's real. Did God not heal the sick? He didn't listen to us. You know, we talk about biological evolution, but I don't think I've heard anyone talk about the evolution of religion. Any religion that has a falsifiable claim has died out. And what we're seeing, I think, this is just a hypothesis of mine, is, I mean, the religions that are enduring are the ones that have morphed into an unfalsifiable Swiss cheese because there's so many holes in it, but it just keeps moving around every time it gets proven wrong. It's like, well, actually, you know, you know, gay marriage is what causes the hurricane and i mean it's like you know my father's good friend passed away from cancer recently i have a i have a my roommate um what grew up secular he became an ex a very religious jew he really sought god he was building um one of the jewish commandments is once a year we have to build these huts and like eat meals in them and kind of live in them and as he was building his first one he fell over he fell onto like a saw and he died and it was horrible and it's like the way that these things have been explained away or just shrugged and be like we don't have any answers we don't have any answers just amazes me and i think what you people like you and me have to understand is and i think this is I, I, I'm curious to know if you would agree with me or not, but 80 to 90 percent of people, they don't they don't care what's real or what's not. They want to believe they choose. They want to believe what makes them feel good. They 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 prioritize happiness over truth. I, I agree. I no, I, I agree with you. I would say the other component of it is that we. One thing I've really been talking about a lot recently, and I especially talked about it with Tyler and others is. The fact that one thing I think sometimes we as atheists don't always understand is that religion is more than the sum of its beliefs. It's an entire system. Yeah. So so it's not just the beliefs. It's the beliefs. It's the customs. It's the traditions. Yep. It's the rituals. Yep. It's the communal aspects. It's the experiential aspects. And the problem is, is that all of those things are in a lot of the things that are about that sort of more the ethereal aspects of religion are like, as you said, they're like Swiss cheese. You can kind of they're 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 not tactile in the way that like specific, you know, falsifiable claims are right. Like yeah. we can we can we can debunk the firmament. We can debunk, you know, the first man and woman. We can you know, we can debunk the fact that donkeys don't talk. Like those are just things we can do, right? Um, but 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 religion succeeds because it it evolves and is a product of of you know in some respects of group level selection. So one of my favorite books I've read recently is The Righteous Mind by Jonathan Haidt, mm. and he has a whole chapter on religion, and he talks about how religion is a team sport. And he, and what he means right. by that, he goes for a lot of people who are part of a religious tradition. The beliefs mean very, very little. 
They, right. They, 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 what really matters more to a lot of people, if you sat and asked them, like, why are you a Christian? Or why are you a Jew? Or why are you a Muslim? Many of them, I would tell you, would sit there and they may whip out a few of the beliefs. But they're also going to say to you, like, I really like going to church. Or I like the songs. Or right. I like getting together with my friends. Or right. I like doing this charity work and things like that. And so I think what we need to do as secular people, and, and, and this is part of what I think is important, is we need to sort of retake the ownership of those things yeah. and, and, make, <coughs> and make them secular. Because yeah. then once we do that and we're successful at that, then religion is just sort of left as the emperor who has no clothes. Right. All that's left is the nonsense. Right. Because it, it's really not the nonsense that keeps people there. It's right. it's it's the it's the it's the the Community. social component of it. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, but but I'm but but see, I say that. But on the same like I'm a very individualistic person. I don't mm -hmm. love being around people all the time. I don't right. tend to love crowds. I don't really do social clubs. Like I'm not interested in those things. Right. But I do think that they're important for many people who want them. Right. Right. You know, it's funny you say that because for years I've fantasized about, you know, living a completely secular life. And even now I, I fantasize about it sometimes, but I, I, I'm the kind of guy that suffers from the grass is always greener. And I, you know, I wonder, and you could only tell me, but I never know what it feels like. Like, is there a sense of community like, like I have now, or if less, how much less in, in the secular world? You know, I mean, we, we, we celebrate Shabbat, the Sabbath every weekend. I don't keep the laws cause I don't believe any of them are real, but you know, we go out for meals with our friends. We go to the synagogue, we see our friends that's how we make friends. We, you know, people, it, it, you know, I know that if one of my kids are sick or, or, or my wife, you know, broke her arm and we have to go to the hospital, we have friends down the block that'll watch our kids for a few hours. I mean, we have a community like that. Um, so, you know, I always wonder how much, you know, I think I don't need it, but maybe I would, maybe I would miss it. I wonder, I really wonder. And I'm, you know, I'm friends with people like Steve Miller and, you know, through their transitions, I'm sure they wonder, I mean, they really, they have it way hard. I mean, I can't even compare what I've gone through to what some other people have gone through, but everyone has their own journey. But a lot of people have had to make, like Steve Miller, have had to make a decision. I don't know his story exactly, but from his world, people have to make the decision whether or not to throw away their entire family and everything they've ever known to venture out into the unknown and and if they'll be happy or not once they're there they don't know and it's terrifying um yeah so i i agree with you and i think like the atheist quote unquote quote unquote the atheist churches or whatever as as funny as that could sound um and i don't think they should call it that but they should call it something else but i do that is the right approach the humanist approach and the the i i do agree with you that is the right approach well, and the thing is, it's 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 really interesting for me because, and I think I may have mentioned this before, but like, since I was never religious and I never had really any of that stuff, and always looked at it as sort of a weird thing that I was never a part of. Yeah. When I became an atheist, like I didn't, I didn't really lose anything. Right. I, I kind of compared it to hearing about somebody winning the lottery. But I don't really give a shit because I didn't pay. I didn't buy a ticket. I, I, you know, I don't care because I'm not in it. It doesn't mean it doesn't affect me. Right. Um, and so, you know, I mean, in terms of my own life, you know, I was really grateful to have um, my dad and my grandmother who basically raised me. Um, my mom and dad divorced when I was in my teens and my dad and I, we moved in with my grandmother and my grandmother and my dad raised me and my grandmother is probably the most kind moral person i know and and she's sort of a very liberal sort of unitarian christian she believes in god but like she's like super liberal she won't go to church because she doesn't like how conservative it is um uh -huh. uh, and things like that she kind of does her own thing my dad is pretty much non-religious he doesn't like the term atheist but that's kind of what he is he prefers the term agnostic yeah um a lot of people do yeah he's kind of one of those people 
Um, well, and he always brings up, you know, because he and I are both big music people, and he always brings up that there's a song by Bob Dylan um, called Gotta Serve Somebody. And, yes. the, and the main chorus of the song is, you know, it may be the devil, it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. And I always responded to that with saying, well, I always preferred John Lennon's song that was a reply to it, which was Serve Yourself. Um, and, and you know, which because you know, John Lennon was basically an atheist. Um, and he wrote, I think, one of the most beautiful lines about what it what what it's like. So he wrote this song called God which was on one of his first solo records, Plastic Ono Band. And he just has this simple line, which is, God is a concept by which we measure our pain. And and so he, he talks about the idea that a lot of people, what he kind of means by that is that, like, for a lot of people, God is a way for us to be able, as a concept, is a way for us to be able to deal with the fundamental nature of suffering. Um, and that one, yeah. of, and one of the common... I think one of the universal things that we as humans all deal with to a certain extent is a certain level of suffering, um, you know, where, where, and, and so, you know, God is a concept. And then he goes on and then he basically does this whole beautiful tirade where he's like, I don't believe in Jesus. I don't believe in Buddha. I don't believe in this. I don't believe in that. At the very end, he goes, I don't believe in the Beatles. I just believe in me. And, right. and, and and when I became an atheist, that song was revelatory because he just goes to this litany of things he doesn't believe in. He's like, I don't believe in kings. I don't believe in Hitler. I don't believe in Krishna. I don't believe uh, he does a little he does a Bob Dylan reference where he says, I don't believe in Zimmerman, which is what Bob Dylan's real last name is. And and uh, and then he goes, I don't believe in Beatles. And that was revelatory because it realized like. One of the things that I think religion does that's harmful is it tells you that your life doesn't belong to you, that 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 your life belongs to something else, and right. and it, and and you must give up your life to the concept of something. And I've always believed in sort of the classical Enlightenment notion of self proprietorship that you own your life, that your life belongs to you. And one of the ways that you fulfill that is by by rejecting religion, because then allows you to live your own life as you see fit. I mean, right. it, does, it doesn't mean you're going to fuck people over and be a dickhead, but it does mean right. that like your life is yours to make of it what you will. Right. And, and, and there's a certain level of virtue in that that I don't think is always explained. And right. part of it is also the fact that I think, and I think what you're doing with your children's books, especially, is a, is a great window into this. Is that a lot of the people who are sort of spokespeople for atheism are they're nerds and and i say that in a very loving way but that's true like they're scientists they're biologists they're physicists they're really 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 smart people who often don't and in some of them i mean are brilliant writers maybe dawkins is brilliant is a brilliant writer right. i think that you know lawrence krauss is a brilliant writer but there aren't a lot of like regular folks who uh, and, or or people who are interested in taking the bigger concepts that these scholars and these intellectuals are developing and putting them in an accessible package for people. Right. And so that's part of why I do my podcast. It's part of the reason why um, I, I, I think that you probably do your book series is a way yeah. of being able to take these concepts and make them accessible to regular people because yeah. we're not going to be able to to really win the, this sort of battle of ideas without yeah. making them accessible to people. Yeah, because not everybody not everybody's going to be as into it as you and me right. um, or or as or as or as inquisitive as you and me. And so we right. got to make it. We got to make it palatable to people. Right, right. Bill and I is trying. Neil deGrasse Tyson is trying. I forgot her name is trying. Um, a lot of people are trying, and I think a lot of them are doing a great job. Um, but, you know, we're just, uh, we're, you know, the, the America is, 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 you know, it's a, the people in America are religious. It's a religious uh, populace. And yep. And we, we love misinformation. We love Alex Jones and and whoever, you know, and I, I don't know why. I think I mean evolution tells us there's a lot of reasons why and yeah, you know, we you know, primates, the alpha male, we need the alpha male to watch over us and and uh, yeah, it's just it'll take a lot of time and I've been optimistic 
because I think the internet, especially the invention of the internet, I, I've always thought truth wins and knowledge wins and it seeps through and superstition comes and goes. But, you know, I, I, I don't know. I mean, when you look at the Middle East and, and some parts of the world, it's, 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 you know, someone said to me, you know, religious fundamentalism is going through its death throes right now. But I don't know, um, with, 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 with recent American politics and, and just a lot of, uh, you know, like you said, I think it's like 70% of Americans believes that angels are real and like 35%, I, I forgot to believe in evolution. I mean, I don't know, it seemed, I, I used to be optimistic, but I don't know, I just don't know. I, I think the few things that give me a little bit of hope is uh, there was a recent poll um, that was covered by USA Today that either with 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 people who accept evolution, um, that it was either in the high 40s or it was in the low 50s, that it had cracked the 50% mark at some point. Now, of that number, 13% of them or somewhere around like in the teens see it the way you and I see it. We, you know, there's still the vast majority of those people who sort of do the God-guided evolution shit. Um, but, but, they, but they do accept the science on some fundamental level. The other thing that... So that's, that's progress. It's not perfect, but it's progress, I guess. But the thing that I think makes me more excited is the fact that the, the Public Religion um, Research Institute published a report last year called Exodus. And in the report, it made the point that that upwards of a quarter of Americans are are the nuns, n o n e s, not nuns with the habit, but but nuns. And that's atheist, agnostic, deist, whatever the fuck. I don't give a shit. Don't want to go to church. That and, and that number is growing. the The part of it that's upsetting to me is the fact that in the 2012 election, they didn't have numbers for the 2016 election. But in the 2012 election, nearly half of that number stayed home and didn't vote. The, yeah. The thing that people need to remember is that evangelical, like radical conservative evangelicals in this country have always been a minority. But they're extremely vocal and they're extremely well funded and extremely well connected. Yeah. Because, um, you know, it's that quote that's attributed to Churchill, but, it, but it's just sort of a common idiom that, you know... Um, uh, the, you know, a lie makes its way around the world before the truth can put its pants on. Yeah. And, I heard this, but yeah. yeah. And, and, and so bullshit's easy to propagate because it's, it's bullshit and it's easy. But the fact that there's a growing amount of people in this country who are now just sort of nuns and of that group, people who are of sort of, you know, our age, people who are 35 and younger, uh, are are it's like a third uh, of those uh, people are non-religious, which is yeah. pretty amazing. Um, I think this country is becoming more secular. I think the crazy shit that we've seen in Washington over the last couple years um, is is emblematic of of a longer trend, which is that our country is becoming more and more secular um, and more and more right. non-religious. Right. Um, and so it's horrible because again. This goes back to the whole thing about organization and things like that is that, you know, with the atheism and free thought and whatever, it's like herding fucking cats. You know, they're, they, we're all sort right. of leaders. We don't see each other as followers. And so it's very hard to get people to sort of congeal and, and care about a social movement. Right. Um, and, and so I think one of the ways that we sort of try to combat that is find organizations and, and social ideas and movements that, that you value. So I'm a member of the ACLU. I'm also a member of Center for Inquiry. Join yep. professional organizations. Do canvassing, you know, do networking, do things like that. Every little bit helps. And and um, one thing I always think about, too, is that, um, you know, progress is slow and incremental. It doesn't happen a lot over time. Um, Michael Shermer writes about this idea in his book, The Moral Arc, where he talks about the idea of a protopia. Not a dystopia, not a utopia, but a protopia, which is a society that just gets gradually better over time. It's not yeah. perfect and shit, you know, we take two steps forward, one step back, but it's a but it's a trend towards progress. And so that's yeah. that's what makes me optimistic is that in the long run, there's a lot of things that are better. You know, there right. are a billion people today 
who who do not live in extreme poverty that lived in extreme poverty 30 years right. ago. Right. Um, there are millions of people around the world who no longer die of of easily um, combated combated diseases through immunizations. Right. There, there's all kinds of things that are changing that are good. The problem right. is is that for every story that's good like that, you hear about measles outbreaks in the U.S. because people don't vaccinate their kids. Right. And so there's that horse shit, right? Right. Um, I don't know. I'm cautiously optimistic. Um, uh, yeah. You know, but the the political – I always think of it this way, and maybe this is sort of the civil libertarian in me, but like progress happens in spite of government, not because of it. You know, government people right. are, are, gener- are sometimes for the most part of the morons that just get in the way of people right. doing things that are good. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, who knows? I sent some Ayn Rand in there when you were talking <laughs> about serving yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I'm I uh, I'm very influenced by Ayn Rand and and uh-huh. objectivism. Um, I don't yeah. adhere to it, but but my friend and Tyler and I we had a long discussion about Ayn Rand in my previous podcast, and yeah. um, I, I I'm in some respects a rational egoist, but uh, yeah. you know what I think is that you. An ideal society is one that, that has a good balance between the rights of an individual and the right. and, and the responsibilities of 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 groups. The populace. And yeah. the populace. And it's yeah. and, and that's really what uh I'm interested in because I think that you know I think there's a lot of good in individualism that is that right. is often sort of painted as like you know people are like fuck you i got mine it's not really about that it's more about like having your own life and being yourself sure absolutely but uh but but it's but but i don't know i mean it it, to me it just seems like oh uh, you know if if we advocate for reason critical thinking democracy human rights yeah i think we'll win in the long run because those ideas are durable as hell and, and they tend to win in the long run yeah and what you were saying about who's showing up at the voting booth, I mean, I've heard it said it's it's a lot easier to be moderately passionate than it is to be passionately moderate. I mean, the extremists always win in the short term because the, the you know, the moderately passionate, I mean, we're just less passionate. We want to watch Netflix, eat pizza, go to the gym, go to work. And we're actually, work, you know, we, we our lives are pretty good because we're educated and we're you know, I'm not talking about you and I. That's so arrogant. No, but you know, the the general, gen, not non extremists are just they're not as passionate about crazy shit, so they're not as prone to to show up at the voting booth, and that's a bad thing. I mean, we need to be passionately moderate. We need to be passionately trying to put reason in people's heads and and that's the issue that that that's more of an obstacle i completely agree with you there was an excellent um opinion piece by david brooks the other day in the new york times where he sort of makes the same point that yeah um we need to make being a moderate cool again um right. there was a time in american history where being a moderate being somebody who is sort of a, a consensus building centrist person yeah. was cool um, yeah. And and uh, part of it is the primary process. The way the primaries work in this country is that the candidates, right. instead of being traditionally chosen by the parties, which is what it was before, they're now chosen by a primary system that's based on a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a vote. Right. Um, I think part of the problem with our democracy is that it became too democratic. Yeah. Um, that, that there's that, that we 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 took away too many of the safeguards. Mm-hmm. against the stupidity of, of the populace or not right. even the stupidity that's a bad way of phrasing but the ignorance of the populace because yeah. i do think that people are rationally ignorant about some things you know right. if you're a single mom who's got like two kids and you work three jobs and you bust your ass every single day you're not always going to sit down and read you know the the you know the articles on trade in the washington post you're not going right. to sit and research every fucking political candidate like right. you don't have the time the resources, or quite frankly, the willpower to do that because your yeah, life is focused on doing other things. Yeah. And so I think, you know, that's why having institutional safeguards like like um, like the political parties and and and, um, you know, and and and, you know, maybe limitations on the amount of days you can campaign and limitations on right. you know campaign finance and things like that. Ways of making the system 
less all-encompassing because you're right. The way that it's set up, it attracts the nutcases. Right. It attracts the people who are dedicated party people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you know, that's, but you know, that's neither here nor there, but, um, but yeah, um, I always hate that phrase, neither here nor there, because it always reminds me of that great joke by George Carlin, where he, he loved playing with words and he'd say like, oh, it's neither here nor there. But where the fuck is it then? <laughs> you know? Um, so, but anyway, um, I think we'll, I think if, I think it's all right with you, I think we'll wrap up. Was there anything yeah. else you'd like to cover before we finish up here? This is your section where you get to plug whatever you want and I will make sure and include things in the show notes as well. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. I really enjoyed our discussion. It was actually kind of lethargic for me. Is that the word? Lethargic? Cathartic. Cathartic. Wow. Lethargic's when cathartic. you're lazy. You know, when I when I, I recently moved from one town in Jersey to another, uh -huh. and I, I was meeting the community, and I always confuse words. And That's I, all right. I was, you know, there's there. I was scared there wouldn't be a lot of diversity here, so I said to someone, I meant to say that, you know, I, I had a fear that it wasn't so homogenous here, but instead I said very loudly that I didn't want to move here because I was scared it was very monogamous. <laughs> <laughs> and, like... Five people looked at me and I, it was just like, okay, like we're kind of monogamous here. No, but I, I, uh, I appreciate your time and this was great. And yeah, people could go to Annabelle and Eden dot com. Um, Annabelle and Eden spelled the most common way. Annabelle and Eden dot com and see our books and I'll send you the Kickstarter link. We have about 10 or 11 days left um, and would really, really appreciate everybody's support. Um, if they could give even five, two dollars, five dollars, um, or order the new book uh, for fifteen, twenty dollars, uh, and really support my project, but also support science and our future. And the new book is coming out really, really amazing. I'm obviously biased, but I'm like really excited about it. It's coming out really well. And uh, I actually was in touch with Lawrence Krauss throughout this throughout my project, and he's excited about it as well. So hopefully, people will check out the link that you're able to post. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. I will, I'll be making a donation to it as well and I'll get a copy so that I can, um, oh. so that I can, uh, donate it to the CFI library here in Indiana so that there's another children's book that's available for kids. Um, uh, Joseph, thank you so much. This has been a real blast. It's been very cathartic on my end as well. Um, I've been speaking to a lot of believers lately, so it's really nice to like talk to another fellow atheist and kind of <laughs> get to ran a bit. Um, yeah. which is kind of nice. Um, and I have to like watch what I say, I guess. Um, but again, this has been an immense pleasure. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. Thanks, Justin. Thanks so much for all your support and your time. And we'll be in touch. Awesome. Thank you. Take care. Take care. And that was my conversation with Joseph Becker. That's it for Reason Revolution this week. Please subscribe to us on SoundCloud, iTunes, and YouTube. If there's a platform you listen to podcasts on that I'm not on, please let me know and I'll try to make it happen. Send us your feedback at reasonrevolutionpodcast at gmail.com. Also follow our Facebook page at facebook.com slash reasonrevolution. Give us a like and a follow over there. You can also follow me personally on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube at The Daily Clark. Until next week, this has been Justin Clark, and this has been Reason Revolution. Reason Revolution.